This is about a spoken language. It's not a programming language. So this is just a, a short roundup for those of you who have no fucking idea what the hell this is. Um, as I said, Lojban, it's the name of a spoken, that is human to human language, uh, which is not to exclude human to computer or the other way around, but still, this is what's supposed to be possible with it. Its basis is predicate logic, which uh, made it interesting to me. And it's relatively young, developed um, from starting in the 1950s and only finished in the 1990s. So before delving into the details, let me give you the overview. Well, we'll start with an introduction, of course. And then I'm just going to introduce the basics of this language so you have some idea um, what this is and how I can say what I want to say. This includes, well, the alphabet, of course, and how to build basic simple sentences. After that, I'm going to go into some more language features that you need to express yourself in spoken languages usually which means, in this case, tenses, questions, and uh, compound words, maybe. I'm not sure if the time permits. Um, there's, there's much more to, uh, to this, of course, but this is just um, uh, a snapshot, basically, to, to give you an idea. So uh, please bear with me if it's uh, in, this is not supposed to teach you how to speak this in one hour, but, um, you know. Um, as the last main section, I'm going to um, speak about uh, Lojban's relation to computers because its structure is very clear and very, um, uh, the grammar is unambiguous, for example. Uh, this, makes it, um, this makes it a good candidate for human-computer interaction, basically. That's what I'm going to, uh, to tell you in this section. And finally, there's a conclusion, of course. So. Mm. What exactly is Lajban? This is the longer part, version of the first slide. I've already said it's a constructed language, or conlang, based on predicate logic. So the basic, uh, the basic structure of a sentence, this is of course not a Lajban sentence, but that's the idea. You have a relation called is going, for example, and you have arguments. So that's a person who's going somewhere, the destination they're going to, and the source uh, they're coming from, and maybe some other arguments depends on the relation. Um, yeah, as I said, development started in the 50s, 1955 to be, pre be precise. And, um, well, there were some, um, the, the original language was not Lajban itself, but Lajban is basically a fork of an original language. It's not so important. If you want to know it, you can read up on this um, development. And the current state of Lajban was uh, was fixed in 1997, so there was uh, there was fluctuation in the language as it was developed, and people were trying different things uh, up until 1997. And there was a at that point they published a book that basically uh, f uh, froze the grammar and the base vocabulary. So now basically the goal is yeah, there's a question. Uh, they is um, the logical language group. It's a, an organization that was founded by the ling some linguists who developed Lajban uh, in order to, to foster its development. And what they're trying to do, I'm, I'm going to get into the, the, the exact goals of the language in a couple of slides. Um, yeah. So um, basically now um, that this is frozen, the, the, the task is to get people to actually speak this. As I said, I'm going to go into why soon. Now, the main features of this language, uh, really short, are its unambiguous grammar. That means you can parse it with a computer. You, didn't, you don't need uh, semantic information uh, about the words or something uh, to find out what the structure of the sentence is. Um, it has phonetic spelling. This means you see a word, you know exactly how it's pronounced and the other way around. You hear a word, you know exactly how it's written. This is also called, called a visual audio um, isomorphism or something. The, the structure is really, really simple. 
which makes it easy to learn. This is important, of course. And um, the root vocabulary uh, comprises about uh, 1,350 words. Um, and these can be combined to form, a, of course, a huge vocabulary. There are, there are uh, lots of uh, ways to combine these words, uh, which is basically a, a layered approach. You can just say them one after another, and it makes a new word. And if one of these combinations becomes more uh, widespread or, or used commonly, then you can shorten them to a, form an entirely new word or something. Um, yeah. So, and the last point is it has no exceptions. This is also, this is of course something you want to have in any language, just the problem is the natural languages kind of failed on this part because they grew. So, now what, uh, what, were the, uh, uh, what was the initial goal of creating this language? Uh, you know probably Esperanto, um, at least by name, uh, whose goal was to make an international language. This was not the uh, original goal of Lajban, uh, although it might very well fit this purpose. Uh, the original goal was research, research into the so-called Sapir-Whorf hypotheses. This is from linguistics, I guess. Uh, in really simple terms, I'm no, I'm no linguist, uh, so please bear with me if this is, this is kind of uh, imprecise. Really simply, this uh, uh, thing says, the structure of your language um, constrains the way you think. And to, try, uh, tr to see if this is true, uh, the null hypothesis is, of course, it, do it doesn't so your, the structure of your language puts no constraints on your thinking patterns. Uh, so what Lajban is supposed to do is see if uh, people who speak Lajban natively, that is, you learn it at childhood, would actually exhibit thought patterns that are not exhibited in any natural language. This would be then considered uh, strong evidence towards uh, the hypotheses being true. So that's the original goal, but I'd like to show that Lajman is of more interest than just this, the, the, the linguistic um, science, uh, but actually it has uh, values that uh, I've written here as a hack of values. It's, you know, uh, those are actually properties that, you, that, that we all love in, in programming languages, like being concise or being precise or uh, stuff like this. Uh, I'll go into it later. And of course, it's just to be a fun talk. It's just to be something interest interesting, which I happened to stumble upon. And, um, but also, I'd like to motivate the actual use of this, because of course, the langu no language is of any use if nobody speaks it. So this is part of, uh, I don't know, maybe raising interest, and if anyone wants so they can learn it, and they can actually speak it to people. There are already people who speak this. Um, me not included, I have to admit. Um, I've only started learning about, I don't know, maybe half or maybe uh, three quarters of a year ago. So I can't talk to you in Lajban yet. <laughs> I'm missing basically the vocabulary. So, but this is also not supposed to be a mobilization speech, like we're all supposed to speak Lajban today, and if you don't, you're a bad person because you're, I don't know, not contributing to my grand vision or something. No, it's not supposed to be this. Just raise some interest. Um, yeah, let me go into this, uh, the, the design of Lajban again. Uh, the specific, uh, the design goals that they built into the language uh, to uh, make uh, possible the Sapir-Whorf research also interesting in their own, um, on their own because, well, what do you need? You need uh, a language that has the same expressive power of all the other natural languages, but has a significantly different structure. So you can see, okay, these people are thinking in a in a different way, and then you hope they will they will uh, you, uh, turn this into new patterns of thought. And uh, yet to go along with this, of course, you want to remove restrictions on creative and clear thought. You want to course, give the people as much room for thinking stuff as they can. Yeah, but I think this is, this is, a, this is a really, um, it's something compelling. But there are other, other points to consider. As I've said already, human-computer interaction is one point. Um, 
also precisely and powerfully expressing yourself is, uh, is of course always nice. Uh, and this is also something you know you look for in computer languages, and programming languages. You're very happy to find a language, oh this lets me express this really, really easy or really, really precise. And, you know, for example, mathematical expressions are really hard to speak in usual natural languages because for example, you don't know where the parentheses are and it's really cumbersome to say open parentheses and now there's a fraction or something which encompasses this, blah, blah. It's really complicated. Um, so, uh, Lodgepin has, has structure, of course, it has the same basic fundamental problems. You have to know like where the parentheses are. But Lodgepin has words for this. It has a word for open parentheses and it's one syllable or something. Um, so, in theory, you can have, there's, uh, there's a big example, which I'm not going to give you, but there's a big example in one of the papers that I read at first, which says basically the integral from, uh, the interval from 0 to 5 over some expression, which is a fraction, contains powers and whatnot, and it's just a logical sentence, and you just know it's, this is unambiguously powers, and this means exactly this expression. It cannot be misunderstood. So, yeah. Another point is it's uh, built to be robust over noisy channels, <laughs> which you know should, you should know what this means. Um, yeah, you can uh, because the sounds of the different um, letters they're uh, designed to be uh, as far away from each other as you can. So you have a lot of range where you can where you can put your actual sound that you either you're saying or your your peer is hearing and he'll still be able to uh, disambiguate the different sounds. Um, and lastly, it's also uh, a good candidate for an international language if you want to do this, which would be nice, definitely. We'll see. So, yeah, let's get into the basics of this language. This is the alphabet, should look familiar, it's basically a Latin alphabet. Just H, Q, and W are missing because these sounds are H is pronounced by different uh, by the um, by this this accent and is not considered a real a real sound. It just uses a filler in some places. And um, Q, you know, strange letters. Um, yeah, you know, Q is sometimes pronounced as Q or K or whatever. And in Lodgman, this is just the K is the K, and the and for Q, this this is a combination of sounds, you, you know. Um, yeah, and W, what's it? Is it W or V or what is it? V is is V in Lodgman, so there. Um, there's you you see, there's no question or exclamation mark. This is because Lodgman doesn't have them. It has words for them, because if you if you had like an exclamation mark. You have, or a question mark in, in English or something, you form a question by reordering the grammar and changing, uh, changing stress uh, on the sentence. Uh, this is not really what you want to have for Lajban or what they didn't want to have, uh, so they made little words. There's a little word that says this is a question. There's a little word that says uh, this is uh, supposed to be strong emphasis or something like this. So that's your alphabet. Uh, most of the letters are just pronounced the way you know them in English or in German, uh, except um, I'm going to show you how to pronounce the vowels, just really short, because they're different than in English usually. They're the same as in German, so the Germans can all just skip this. Uh, but of interest is the Y, which is uh, pronounced uh, as an above. Um, the other ones are, you know, A, A, E, O, U. And there's no, no real, it doesn't matter how long you pronounce them. It doesn't matter if you deviate a little, like you say oo or oo or o or o, or it's no, no matter. There's some special consonants that I should tell you. The, the C is pronounced sh, you know, as in shirt. J is zh, and uh, S is always sharp. V is always sharp, voice. And the X is pronounced as in loch and ach. You can also say or it doesn't make a difference as long as it's some kind of, you know, sound in the back of your throat. And the Z is magazine. As I said, variations are permitted as long as it's distinguishable somehow. And, uh, oh, in particular, yes, the R, which is a problem for most languages. It can be any rhotic sound. It can be 
it can be R, it can be R, it can be R, it's no, really, really nice. Oh yeah, the punctuation characters. These are not punctuation in our usual sense, they're sounds, but not, they're kind of like half sounds or something. The, you know, the, the accent is, is like huh, a head, um, and, but the point, the, the, the full stop, it just means uh, you have to make a pause in speaking. Like usually you can run Lajman words on another. You don't have to make a, make a pause anywhere. Uh, except for special cases, and in these cases, you put a uh, you put a period there. And the comma is uh, uh, sub you don't have to write this usually, but if you do, because you don't speak it, it's not spoken. Um, it in uh, it means it's a non-standard syllable break. This occurs in some uh, in some words. I'll show you an example later. So, how do you build a basic sentence? I've already showed you this uh, pattern up there. Um, which illustrates the concept. It has a predicate, in this case comes to, which is in Lajman called a, a breedy. I'll use this word from time to time. And the arguments are called sumti in Lajban. Um, yeah, so it's predicate and arguments. You can remember this. And the syntax is, as shown here, uh, always the first argument comes first, then comes the, the predicate or relation, and then the rest of the arguments after it. Um, there's no filling in between the words, it's just run them uh, one after another. Uh, yeah, this usually makes it um, the way, because um, the reason why we have the, uh, the, the first argument in, uh, first is this makes it you, uh, often so have the same form uh, as the subject verb object form in most natural languages. Oops. Um, yeah, you'll see it later. So, we need some words, of course, to make a real Lajban sentence. First, we need some objects or subjects, which will be persons in this case, because it's very easy to, to use names. So the cast is Pesco and Maya. Pesco, that's my nickname, and Maya is in the audience. Uh, to use these names, we'll Lajbanize them. This is necessary to make the grammar unambiguous. And um, we could also use the original spelling and pronunciation of the names, but this would require some kind of escaping construct, which is available like for instances like, say, you want to write something in Lajman, you want to uh, mention Goethe, and you want people to recognize the name by its spelling, then you can use this. But usually uh, it's too cumbersome. So how do you Lajmanize a name? You transcribe it phonetically, just use the letters so it sounds right in the end. And there's two restrictions. It, it must end in a consonant. This is just something that the grammar says. And it must end in a pause, because you have to know where does the name end, on which consonant is the end of the name. So you have to put a pause there. So doing this, uh, this is the result. This is pronounced, you know, ma, yar. The consonant is arbitrarily chosen. Um, you can use anything that sounds right, and pescos is me, and the period says the pause. And now this little particle, la, I've said here, this is the name itself, and this is the sumti form. If you want to use it as an argument uh, in a sentence, you have to put la in front of it. It's, it's just a flag word that says a name follows, also for grammatical unambiguity. So La says, here's the name, it starts, and the, 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 the pause says, oh, here's the end of the name. So, what's our example relation? The word is Klama, it means to come or go somewhere. It has five arguments, or direct arguments, you can add more with special words if you need them. Their order is, of course, significant, and this is called the place structure um, of the word that explains what, what it means. You know, you have clama, you write it in the syntax that I've said before, and then you have the, the arguments one through five, and um, that's what it means. First argument, argument is the person or whatever is coming somewhere. The second argument is where it's going. Third, where it's coming from. Fourth is the way that I'm using or that X1 is using, and five, is a, supposed to be some kind of vehicle or means of transportation or whatever. Yeah? 
Uh, there's a, for example, you can put a word in the X4 place. Oh yeah, the question was, I'm sorry. The question was, uh, what do you do if you want to leave, wa leave one of the arguments in the middle out? Um, there's a little word, call, uh, which is Zohe, uh, which means this place is unimportant. Yeah, so you can put that there. And there's also some other ways, like if you just want to uh, say the, the X5 argument and you need none of the others, then you don't want to go Zohe, 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 Zohe and have your, have your peers counting all the time. Uh, there's some words that you could use to rearrange this uh, place structure. Like you put, put a little modifier word in front of Klama and then it becomes like, instead of coming from somewhere, uh, c coming to something, it becomes coming from and so on. Uh, but these are details, I'm going to skip them in this talk. They're in the paper though, you, if you read the paper version, I'm going to give you the URL, uh, it'll be explained in more detail. So now we know all the pieces for a first sentence. The relation is Klama and the arguments are La Pescos and La Mayar. Um, and so this is, this is how you say it. First argument, relation, second argument, what's this? Shu, it's, um, it's a structure word, it's, also, it's a flag word that says uh, after this word there's the relation, the breedy. You can usually leave it out, uh, but in some uh, instances it's useful to put it, so I just said it here. Um, yeah. Also you see there's only two arguments given, you can just drop the last ones. You leave them out. There's always a maximum of five arguments for uh, these relation words. Um, you can, and you always drop the last ones that you're not interested. This is equivalent to saying Zohe for the last few arguments. It's the same meaning, just easier to say. Now, if we want to have some more interesting objects or subjects than uh, only names of peoples or people or places, you can use, for example, pronouns or prosumti, as they're called in Lajban, or by Lajbanists. They're the analog of pronouns. The thing is, why I'm always saying sumti and stuff is because the usual grammatical categories of, say, verb and object and subject don't really apply because of the different structure of Lajban. So that's why you just use a slightly the, the Lajban word for them. Uh, so here you see a list. Me, do, ti, ta, me, you, this, that. Uh, you put them in any of the sumti places just like this. No, no, no extra whatever. You just put it, yeah? Uh, no, this is, so pro sumti is not a large one word. This is, you know, a mixture. It's a, a bastard. But that's the term that's used by the large banists. Another way of getting your objects are articles. Um, these, uh, there are different ones. There are different uh, words like uh, this. Uh, you see le in this example, which is close in meaning to the English the. Um, there are some others that have like, like an indefinite article or something like this. Uh, what this word does, le in specific now, it turns a, a relationship, like, um, like before, as you used to build sentences, into an argument. So it basically says uh, the thing that is in this relation or that would fit this relation. That's what it says. There's a next, the next slide will um, explain it. Again, ku is a terminated word which uh, is necessary to put there in case ambiguity could result, but usually you can leave it out. So to give you an example, uh, the word gunka means uh, x1 works on x2 with goal x3. And now if you say la gunka, it means the workers. It means something, some th specific thing that I have in mind which would fit the x1 place of gunka. It's always the x1 place. Um, if you want another place, you have to use a, a modifier word on gunka which switches the place structure. As I've said before, these are available. So if you want to say something, um, the work, it would be, you know, the X2 place, something that fits the X2 place of Gunka, you would say, le se Gunka. The se is a, a modifier word that says, 
uh, swap the places x1 and x2. So last Sagunka is the work. Uh, yeah, also note that there's neither singular or plural implied. These things could be, you could mean a set of things. Um, there are other ways to specify the cardinality of whatever you're talking about. Okay, let's go to some more expressive, some more features. So now you know uh, the basic sentences. You can say, I'm going there and I'm coming to the market or whatever. And uh, this is not interesting, of course, usually. What you say is more complicated. Um, just for ins uh, instructive purposes, let me introduce some of this. Tenses in Lajban. Uh, usually, you know, a tense means something with uh, respect to time. In Lajban, it also means something with respect to space. Usually, you say a tense to mean, well, whatever is going on is going on at this and that point, either in the future or in the past. In Lajban, you use the same thing to say it's going on in front of me or behind me or left or up or wherever, because it's the same concept. It's just a different uh, dimension, you know. So this, uh, the system for using this is actually quite flexible in Lajban. You can say stuff like, uh, well, very far in the future, I'm going to be working slightly to the left of myself and very, very uh, deep below, you know. <laughs> This is, you know, uh, you can say these things. It's not really complicated. I'm just not going to uh, explain it here uh, for time, uh, reason of time constraints. Uh, this also works. Uh, the way this works is, uh, all, again, you attach a modifier word to the to the breedy, in the which means, you know, this relation that you're thinking about, whatever is in the relation, uh, is. Um, in this relation in some other time or some other place. So as an example, let me t uh, tell you the basic temporal modifiers. Uh, pu for past, sha is present, and ba is future. So if I say la pescos ba clama la maya, it means that I will be going to maya in some, at some point in the future. It doesn't say specifically very soon or very, very, very late, it just says it's in the future with respect to the point uh, of time at which I'm expressing this. So when I say it now, it means tomorrow or something, and if I say tomorrow, it means the day after or whatever. Yeah. Mm, another interesting but not so complicated uh, part of Lajban grammar is uh, how, to, how, to, uh, how to ask a question. This is important, of course. Um, there are basically two kinds. One are questions after truth values, like is it true that this and this holds? And the other is our fill in the blanks questions. Um, I'll give you more details now. First for truth value questions. These are really easy to make. You just prefix your entire statement with the particle who, which means does the whatever is coming after it, does this hold, is this true? So this question that I'm having here, Hula Maya Klama La Pescos, means is it true that Maya comes to or goes to Pesco? There you go. Real simple. Uh, I'm not going to give you the details about answering right now. Um, it's simple. Of course, you can just repeat the statement. This is cumbersome. There are shortcuts for this. Um, you can read it in the paper. It's kind of interesting because uh, Lajman doesn't have actually the wor words for yes and no. There is no word like this. There's, like say for yes, uh, you use a word that means, which is a placeholder, um, kind of like prosumpti, but not assumpti. It stands for an entire sentence. It means repeat the last sentence. So I just say repeat the last sentence to you, and this means yes. And uh, if I want to say no, I prefix this word by a little, by a little negation particle, the regular negation particle. I say, um, repeat the last sentence, but no. <laughs> uh, actually, you could say, repeat the last sentence, but omit the who. Oh, yeah, that's true, of course. Yeah, the, 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 there was a, a remark, the, the who is not considered part of the last sentence because saying the last sentence, it's kind of sloppy, uh, uh, that's my fault. Uh, you're not actually repeating the last sentence, you're repeating the last relation. Uh, you're, you're restating the last relationship and uh, all the arguments, if you don't specify them, 
default to whatever was used in the previous occurrence. So that's the actual mechanism. So the who is not part of it, that's true, yeah. Fill in the blank works for both relations and for arguments. For relations, use the word mo. Just put it in the breedy place. So this is a standard example, la logban mo. Uh, this means, what is logban? Or more specifically, which relationships is logban part of? So you would answer to this by saying something which has logban in the x1 place. And that's all. For arguments, you use another particle. It's called ma. Um, you can use it multiple times. Ma kla ma ma means who goes where or what goes where. Mm. Yeah. So this introduces the basic language features that I wanted to go into. Um, so you have, I hope you have a, a, a slight idea of uh, how all this is supposed to fit together. Mm. Now, how do we apply this to computers, or can we apply this to computers? Um, for all of these um, applications, of course, you need to assume some level of uh, proficiency in LogBan on some part of the user base. If you want to make a LogBan human-computer interface, which is talk to the computer in LogBan and it will answer in LogBan, of course, the user has no LogBan. Uh, so, it's just, just a note. And um, I haven't really investigated these things deeply. It's just stuff that pops, uh, that comes to mind, like, like uh, interesting ideas that you might want to look into more deeply, maybe next year. So, yeah, talk to your computer in LogBan. This is uh, compelling because LogBan grammar is actually specified as a yuck machine language. Uh, grammar specification, so it's uh, the pauses for it, machine pauses for it are really, really uh, available. Also, the uh, the isomorphism between spoken and written form is useful, of course, because it makes it uh, really easy to build a, a spoken language interface. Uh, yeah, so you can just parse in an entire sentence, and you know exactly the sentence structure. There's no no, no guesswork or anything. You just know what your peer is saying. Uh, or you, in this case, supposed to mean the computer. For example, you might want to try to just recognize a question or an imperative, which is easy, as you uh, have seen in the case of questions. You just recognize the little question works, uh, words. And in imperatives, it's also very easy, because in an imperative, you have another word that you look for. That's it. And then you might want to try just basic pattern matching on these sentences that come in. You know, you have this data structure representation of the LogBan sentence, comes in, you do a pattern match on it, and um, you'll recognize, oh, this is a question, and maybe you'll recognize the other parts of the sentence, and maybe you'll be answered, able to answer the question, but there you have a natural language interface. Just do this uh, really, really hard, uh, thoroughly, and you have a very, a very um, uh, wide natural language interface. Or maybe you just want to constrain yourself to some suitable subset of LogBan. Still, this might be a good, um, a good thing, a good basis. If you ha can assume that your users speak LogBan, they will be happy about this. Uh, another thing that came to my mind, I'm not entirely sure about this, but um, you know the problem of internationalization of programs. What you usually do is say GNU get text or whatever, um, is you have a base language in which you write all your messages that the program is supposed to produce, and uh, you translate these messages. You have a prefixed pr translation table, and this al always has problems with di uh, incorporating dynamic data into the message. Like say you want to say, oh, there's been five errors. Now in English you have to say, uh, what's the plural of error? And you have to decide, do I have to use the plural form or not? In LogBan, well, this doesn't apply at all, but um, Still, um, even if you don't want to pr uh, produce LogBan, it might be a good idea to use LogBan as the base language, I thought, because uh, usually your program doesn't understand the structure of the, uh, its base language, if it's English, and it doesn't understand the structure of the target language, so it has, it has no hope of, uh, of generally producing uh, correct, grammatically correct messages, except 
you have to, you know, you have to look at each uh, case basically, or or hope that the structure of the language will be clear enough. For example, say in German, it's much more harder than in English to, produ uh, pr uh, to produce a correct. Uh, plural form of, of something and you have to invent, invent complicated structures to do this in your whatever and then you also have to you have to recognize your the structure in the base language so maybe large one might be might be beneficial also there's auto translation already um, available to English which works fairly well it's uh, of course not perfect and it could use more work but it has been available for a long time and you can usually understand the sentences just because the structure is so clear even if it's not real english you can see what the hell is supposed to, uh, what the hell is supposed to mean just by looking at this, uh, the structure and the gloss words yeah, another idea is, can I use large bond words maybe to name my identifiers and programs? I had a nice anecdote uh, by Palas, who's going to hold the Esperanto talk. She told me that they kind of, um, they had a nasty experience with someone who was commenting his programs in large bond and nobody else was understanding them afterwards. <laughs> so, well, you might want to avoid this if you're not entirely sure about your uh, uh, co-workers or whatever is coming after you look at the code is going to understand large bond. But in principle, um, as I've said, assuming that you have the proficiency, um, this might be an idea, using this for naming your identifiers, because as I've said, you don't need pauses. You don't need spaces in between large bond words. It's still paused correctly, as long as maybe you deal with the punctuation characters, like say use another character for this or that. But it would probably be possible, and those are not, they are not so frequent. Mm, also, you might again use the, uh, uh, the fact that uh, making questions and imperatives is really easy in large bond. Also, maybe you could just use the bare uh, root words for say, naming a relation and prologue, which would be an obvious uh, match, of course, but also maybe functions, because many of the, fu uh, of the root words have the structure x1 is something, like x1 is a car of brand x2, blah, 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 blah. But um, so uh, maybe if you want to make something that means x1 is whatever, whatever, uh, and that's what your uh, function is supposed to produce, then you might just use the, this relation word that you made up uh, to name your function. Who knows? Please investigate. <laughs> okay, so this is already near the end and quite in time. And um, yeah, now if this is, uh, sounds at all interesting to any of you, if you want to learn it, uh, I can tell you it takes only a few days to get the basic grammar. And by basic, I mean not like I go to Maya, I mean uh, including tenses, including relative sentences, including uh, like, you know, me who has been working at the Congress very hard for the last couple of days all the way up on the top or something uh, is going to go to Maya in a few uh, minutes. Uh, that's, that's really, it encompasses almost everything. Uh, it took me, I think, three days to read this, uh, a certain booklet that I have in mind. Yeah, and after that, of course, the problem is you need vocabulary. This, there's only one way to get it, it's practice. There are uh, programs uh, available for flashcard-based uh, learning, and um, I've personally found it quite useful to, um, to attempt small conversations or small translations and just build a personal word list. Like today, I've used these and these words. There's a very nice online dictionary interface that you can use to look up stuff, and you just make a list, and today I needed these and these words, and then you learn them before you go to bed or something. Um, yeah, for conversations, there's Channel Lodgebun on Freenode. Uh, the people are very friendly, very crazy also. Um, nice place. <laughs> yeah. So that's already pretty much it. Let me conclude with a summary. Um, I think you can see the, uh, a little that Lodgebun is built to be very, uh, very clean and simple and also precise. Uh, that's one thing they wanted to do, uh, make the language so there is, you don't have to use ambiguity. Like, for example, um, emotions. 
In most natural languages, you don't express emotions directly. Um, you, you do it by using phrases or, or uh, differences in stress of your pronunciation or whatever. Uh, in Lajban, you have, you have words that you can use to directly express, I'm very happy about this, or I'm not quite so happy. Um, this is open to experimentation. No, but no language has had this, I think, I've read uh, so far, or at least not to this extent. Um, but also uh, keep in mind that um, Lajban doesn't force you to use this stuff, of course. You can, you can put all the ambiguity into your, uh, your, your um, speech that you want, if you want, but you can also remove it. So this is quite compelling, I think. Also, of course, it's supposed to be general. It's supposed to be a language that, that you can use to express anything you want to express. Uh, one interesting example that I stumbled upon in this regard is the word uh. I've shown you the, it's just one character. Uh, the, one, the one vowel, the one that's written as the Latin Y. Um, you say this anywhere, what does it mean? Well, it means, hold on, I'm, I'm thinking. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, and this is specified in the language, in the reference documentation. It's good. <laughs> so, yeah. Also, if you, wanna, if you actually want to use this as a, as a human computer interface, this might make the return of the comment line, I thought. I mean, you're giving language stuff. I read an interesting paper once uh, by some guy who was teaching uh, to use a, a pe uh, people to use a computer um, who had never ever had contact with computers before. Uh, he had done this for a couple of uh, years already with uh, varying su success using the usual graphical interface, Windows, blah, blah. Uh, and he tried an experiment, switching to the comment line, the Linux comment line. And he found out actually it worked quite well because the people found it easier to understand to just give the thing a comment as long as they knew what the comment was and um, uh, had a mental model of how the com computer reacts to the comments. But this is in principle a, a, a more simple way of, of thinking about this thing because it's, it's sequential, you know, it's not there's windows popping up everywhere. This uh, seemed to confuse the people. Uh, that there was so much stuff on the screen. It's, uh, it was easier to understand for them to just give it a comment and see it do whatever you told it. Um, and not interrupt you in doing something else. For example, you've got new mail. Like, your computer screams at you, you've got new mail, or pops up a window or with an instant message while you're doing something important. It uh, might be considered distracting. Um, yeah. So... The one problem that these people had with the comment line, though, was that the comments were kind of cryptic. Uh, one person um, said, oh, you have to talk to the computer in text, meaning text speech as you use it to send uh, SMS messages on your phone, because everything was abbreviated. Usually, you abbreviate stuff in SMS. So at this point, the person understood how to talk to the computer. Oh, you have to abbreviate everything. Now it's all clear. So. Uh, yeah, uh, so this is of course obvious to us, but to some people it isn't. And um, so, if you want to use, uh, if you use Lajban, you actually have the real language. So, proficiency assumed. So that's nice. Now, the outlook of the talk is: we need Lajban speakers. One thing is to to verify Sapir Whorf, which makes the scientists happy. Uh, but also to make the language usable for all the applications that I've talked about. Um, yeah, as I said, this is part of the goal of my talk, to um, get people interested in learning this. I'm open to, uh, uh, to, to forming some kind of group to, talk, uh, to, to speak Lajban, of course. Let's just meet in channel Lajban. Yeah. And also, of course, further research into how to actually employ this with computers. I've said I haven't investigated any of these ideas. It's just, um, yeah. So, now for further reading, just as I've said, check out the paper version. This is the URL, prefix it by HTTP if you want. And um, your web browser should work with it. Um, it includes, <laughs> aside from other extractions, answering. 
and um, also narrowing meaning and compound words like relative sentences and building compound words. This is interesting, it's really not so complicated, but I don't have time right now. Also the logic stuff. There's a full range of logical uh, connectives in Lajban. You can say this implies that really easily. Uh, well, you can use, do it in English as well, but for example, the mind-numbing or or x or question. It's clear in Lajman, so there you go. And you have all the other, you have reverse implication words, and they are also built very logically. They're built from another. They just take a base uh, set of logical connectives and build all the others by, by, um, by negating one part uh, of, the, of the statement or the other or uh, swapping arguments. Some, there's some nice structure in it. So that's going to give you uh, some more details and will be interesting. But if you really want to learn stuff about Lajban, check out the website lajban.org. Really simple to re uh, remember. Uh, there's one thing that's a level called Level Zero book. Uh, this is the one that I read in three days and um, or four or whatever. There's also some beginner's lessons that take a, a, a little slower pace. Um, if you prefer, like this level zero book is if you have, if you're you're impatient and you wanna, you're going to, you're okay with a little, you know, going a little faster. And then there's a reference grammar. It's called a reference grammar. Sounds scary, but it isn't. It's a really nicely written book. You can just read it like this. It also has jokes in it and nice pictures. It's just a normal book, basically. But it is the authoritative reference. Um, so. For specific questions like, say, how does this really work with the mathematical formulae or how does this really work with the logical connectives? You can look it up in this and it will not scare you away like other standards might. Yeah, so that's it. Um, questions? Okay. The, want the mic? Are there, uh, there are any German documentation? Are there any German documentation? Um. <laughs> yeah, good point. There's Esperanto documentation. Learn Esperanto and then use it to learn Lajban. That's a nice hack. <laughs> um, I'm not sure entirely. I think there is. I think m many things are translated. I'm not entirely sure whether like I, the level zero book in particular is or the, the, these lessons are. Um, just look at the website, please. Um, do you want to pass this? Do you want to pass? Um, does Lojman have uh, any <coughs> difference of uh, levels of uh, formality in speech, or uh, do you speak to, uh, uh, to the Queen the same way you speak to your family? I would um, suspect that you speak to the Queen the, queen the f same way as you speak to your family. What is the result of the study uh, that uh, so, so uh, does does large bond change uh, the structure people think, or well, we don't know yet. Oh, okay. Uh, we, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. you need uh, you need to have uh, native speakers. So teach large bond to your kids, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it seems that there's a lot of meta information in the language. Of what? Meta information. Meta information, like like the the modifiers and the the words that change uh, other words, or mm -hmm. like the the swapping of placement. Mm -hmm. It seems like there's a lot of additional information in the language, so the information content is higher. But you also said that it is very robust in noisy channels, mm -hmm. and those seem like conflicting uh, statements. How mm -hmm. how is it robust? Is it in terms of just phonetically? Or? It's basically phonetically, yeah. Uh, but it's also, I guess it's also a point that, um, like you... Like you used uh, two example words, shu and hu. Mm -hmm. And in a noisy room, um, yeah. or if you know one character gets deleted in an online transmission, yeah. uh, then you completely lose the meaning of the word. I would guess that, yes, you would lose the meaning of the word, but you would recognize this sentence as making no sense. 
That's that would be my guess. Okay. But yeah, it's a it's a good point. It's uh, correct that especially the short words, uh, these structural words, um, are uh, that they hamper the the goal of robustness over noisy channels. This is uh, known, and they just the language designers have tried to minimize it, but there are limits. Well, at the beginning, you said to us that every name needs a consonant. Uh, in the at the end, yeah. At, at the end, yes. And how we know which consonant we use? You can use any. <laughs> Just choose the one that sounds best. Usual are S or R. Um, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, do you think that LodgeBan is useful for world knowledge representation, something like uh, the Psych project? Uh, Oh, sorry, I didn't understand. For interfacing, uh, word knowledge interpretation with strong AI encoding of, of word knowledge, like a table has, uh, um, consists of, and uh, this is a class of, and etc. I'm not sure I understand the question. Can you maybe... Um, um, do you think rephrase? that the language of LodgeBan is useful for the description of a strong AI uh, word knowledge? World knowledge? Um, about artificial intelligence, world knowledge, like um, well, well, trivial, trivial issues um, mm. in, a, in a database. Like in, with, an example is the Psych project, um, okay. OpenPsych.sourceforgeNet, uh, uh, for instance. Okay. Um, as an in, or interfacing with sh such databases. I guess I'm not uh, familiar with the uh, with the topic uh, of, of okay. these um, AI uh, problems, so. I'm not really qualified to answer. Put a question inside, and uh, um, on the knowledge uh, the system knows, uh, maybe it can answer it. Yeah, or like if you have a relational database, it's um, yeah, it would be useful, because yeah, probably, but it. It makes the structure more complicated also, of course. I'm, I'm not sure about this. I wonder how new vocabulary is imported to the language, especially thinking about technical terms and so on. Well, um, there are um, some technical terms in the, in the base words, like there is one for computer, for example. I'm not entirely sure what you would do if this was not available, but I, the, but I guess the only way you can always work with this is describing it, uh, like form another word, uh, like form the word from other words. For example, computer, the word itself, is derived from the word to compute. We understand it differently nowadays, but yeah. Uh, I thought about things like Bluetooth and so on. Bluetooth. How would you import? Well, well Bluetooth is a name. So you import just the, you can import the name by either either directly or, or transcribing it maybe. I was wondering uh, if I had to teach this this Lochman to my children mm. and to have this effect of the new thinking mm. uh, if I'm forbidden to teach them any other language. Uh, no, definitely not. Um, <laughs> I don't think the. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> it would be kind of. Uh, of course, this is not. This would would not be real, realistically feasible, not teaching people other languages. But um, I don't think it would hurt either. As I said, I'm I'm not a linguist. I'm not a specialist on these issues. But I mean, uh, Lodgman is supposed to remove constraints. So to to. Um, uh, motivate your brain to uh, um, to exhibit new patterns of thought. Um, I wouldn't think that other languages specifically demotivate your brain, uh, like to <laughs> counter the effects of whatever Lodgman is hoped to have. So, no, please, uh, you can speak German with your or English with your or whatever you want <laughs> with your children. <laughs> Um, I think it's 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 quite difficult um, 
if I understand it, uh, understood it the right way, that you have to know the arguments of the relations mm -hmm. for every relation and sure. um, and the correct order. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is quite difficult. Uh, in, 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 in our normal languages, we use uh, "I'm going right. to" right. and and and. Um, mm -hmm. I understand the question. Um, uh, you do have to learn the argument, uh, uh, the the place structures as part of the vocabulary. However, they are usually um, easily guessed. So, as I said, usually you have this kind of subject verb object structure. So you learn uh, you learn the gloss word like go or come for klama, and you can you can kind of recognize the pattern. It's always the most important arguments come first. And uh, it's first usually whatever, the first argument is usually whatever is performing some action, and the second is the object that the action is performed on, and then come additional information. And you can, you can if you don't know the exact place structure, you can, um, uh, and you don't want to do the, the guesswork in the later arguments, uh, you can, there are words to add additional um, places to a relation. Uh, so you can uh, probably uh, speci specify whatever you want to say by using a specific word, even if there is a, s a standard or default place. Yeah. And otherwise, this is of course something you have to disambiguate. You can ask your peer whatever uh, whatever he means. Um, with all this logical structure in the language, it might be a fun project to have a computer listen to a discussion between two people mm. and do a logic check of the arguments they're putting forward. So you have some kind of, <laughs> some kind of bullshit detector yeah. for politi political discussions or scientific talks or something. Very good idea. Yeah, let's do it. Of course, uh, yeah, Lajban understand if the discussion is held in Lajban, then you get all the, you know, you have the preci uh, precision, of course, and you can run your, your whatever uh, proof checker on it. <laughs> so there, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, um, I have a question on questions. So you can um, ask a question about an ar um, argument with ma, mm -hmm. and you can question the relation with mo. Yeah. And how do you know the place structure of a relation you're asking for? You don't. Um, you're, uh, as the example la loge bon mo, uh, la loge bon is in the x1 place, right? And uh, so what you're asking is, I want a relationship which has la loge ban in the x1 place. So uh, remember that you can switch the place structure around. So if your particular relation doesn't fit loge ban in the x1 place by default, well, you attach a modifier to, to rearrange. Good. Is that it? Okay, thanks.